Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Yes, hi. Uh, welcome to the Cleveland Clinic, Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. Um, who is a newcomer? Who's your first time? Wonderful. Wow, well, we're great to see all new faces. Uh, we really appreciate you coming down here. And guess what? You're sitting in that wavy part of the building, right? The iconic Frank Geary building. We've um, come to love. Uh, this is our event center, and um, we do education and weddings and all sorts of fun events here. Uh, and if you're here for the 50th time, thank you for your continued support in joining us. I'm Kat Hartley. I'm the project manager for our Healthy Brains initiative, healthybrains.org. It's our online tool to educate people about brain health and get you interested in learning more about our research as well. Um, you can visit my coworker, uh, Brooke. Wave, Brooke. Um, he helps, uh, he and I run Healthy Brains together, and we have our uh, volunteers from Caesars. Uh, we are, got a generous donation from Caesars to make Healthy Brains free and available to all of you. So I encourage you to make sure you get your brain health checkup. So if this is your first time to the Cleveland Clinic, uh, we do treat people who have all types of dementia, which we're going to talk about that today, and also Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, as well as multiple sclerosis. But a big part of that is our model is to provide care and support for the caregiver. We know these are really tough diseases, um, so we spend a lot of time raising money. So support for the family, the whole care partner, um, can be well taken care of. So that's a wonderful thing. We also, um, one of our um, important missions is to provide education. Uh, we get grants to put on uh, education lectures as this, um, and today's event is sponsored by uh, the Global Alzheimer's Platform. We have Lisa in the background who helped provide the lunch and made this all possible. <laughs> and her group, we call it GAP, not like the store, but GAP as in um, they're filling in the gaps in trying to accelerate uh, Alzheimer's research. They're helping centers like us and across the country um, make it easier for us to get people into clinical trials. So hopefully one day we'll find that cure that we all want. So thank you, Lisa, for your dedicated work. And just a little housekeeping. Uh, there's plenty of coffee and water and tea available. And then that might need you to decide you need to know where the bathroom is. And uh, we have bathrooms on both sides, so there won't be a break. So please just get up and um, help yourself. You can actually still hear the lecture in the restroom. <laughs> Isn't that fancy? <laughs> so that's nice. So don't just take care of yourself. And if you could turn your cell phones off so we don't have any interruptions and we can um, pay attention to our wonderful speaker. And also, on your table is a seek and find for you to enjoy um, for yourself now, and you can you turn it over and um, use it for notes. And then also we gave you a white note card. During the lecture, I'd love for you to write down any questions you may have. And you're gonna be able to ask questions to our speaker, Brian, and also to Dr. Ritter who um, is in charge of our clinical trial program and a neurologist here. Um, if you have questions you want specifically addressed by either one of those, please write Dr. Ritter or um, Brian Brown, uh, and we'll direct those at the end. We're going to collect those and have that at the end of the day, at the end of the session. And um, if you want to identify your name, be, you're welcome to, like the Dear Abby column. <laughs> Um, you can say who it's from, or you can say anonymous. 
So, um, I just also wanted to make sure you realize we are filming this seminar um, back in the back. So, if you don't mind um, having your, the back of your head filmed or your question, just be aware um, this will go out on the internet. Uh, we do use social media. We will be taking pictures. Um, I just want everyone to be aware. All right. I would like to introduce our amazing speaker, Brian Brown. Yes? A memory screen? Go to healthybrains.org. Uh, healthybrains.org, and there you can um, RSVP there. Okay? Uh, see uh, Brooke in the back, and we'll get your information. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, we have our guest speaker flew in this morning from Arizona, from Phoenix. Um, he used to work with, uh, very closely with our uh, new director, Dr. Sabah. And he's had years of training or uh, work in um, providing dementia care um, education. And he's just a, a fabulous speaker and a fabulous guy. I've certainly enjoyed getting to know him, and I know you're going to love this. So uh, without further ado, Brian Brown. Thank you, and it is my pleasure to be here with you. We're going to unpack a lot of information about us and aging and our brains, and, and we're going to put it in a context that we all can understand. So when we think typically about aging, we always go to the physiological side of aging, meaning what's happening to our bodies as we age. And typically, let me make sure this is working here. Here we go. Perfect. So the physiological aspects of aging is what we typically look at first. We look at our physical appearance. We look at how the aging process really starts to set in. And that is kind of the starting point. They always say aging isn't for sissies, right? Because there's a lot of things that start to happen um, during that process. We look at all of these things, but there's some things that we can't see in terms of the aging process. And we're going to talk about that specific aspect of brain aging. So let's go back to the year 1906. 1906 was the year Dr. Alois Alzheimer, a German neurologist and pathologist, had some patients that were acting out of sorts, had some memory complaints and some behavioral things. And was looking for a way to get his arms around what was transpiring. So being a neurologist, saw and observed, but there was nothing that he can do at that particular point. And being a uh, pathologist as well, when they died, he was able to pop open their brains and look inside to see what was going on. Couldn't see anything with the naked eye. And so he decided to get some silver stain and stain the brains of people who were perfectly normal and those who were acting out of sorts. And boom, it lit up like a Christmas tree. What we now know as the plaques of beta amyloid lit up in the brains of people that were out of sorts. So Dr. Alzheimer's was the first to both clinically and pathologically define what we used to call senility or hardening of the arteries, those types of phrases before. And so him being the first to, to look at this, um, the disease was subsequently named after him. Fast forward to the amount of cases that Dr. Alzheimer saw, and he didn't see that many cases. And the reason that he didn't see that many cases of this disease is this phenomenon that we realize now. As we age, processes unfold. So back in 1906, the average life expectancy was 49 years old. Fast forward to today, we're seeing life expectancy go farther than we could have imagined. 
And so if we look at our population, even back in 1960, which wasn't that long ago for a lot of people, and then we fast forward to 2020, which is basically in a few months from now, we look at the proportion of people aged everywhere from 75 to 84, go over seven times as many people just from 1960, and 85 and over even more than that. So we have this boom and this longevity in this aging continuum. So one of the things that we've discovered as we age is that there's these things called diseases of aging, things that we didn't know before, and this is why we're seeing numbers exploding. So in terms of Alzheimer's disease, it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and continuing to climb because of these population statistics. And so it's a good news and a bad news situation. The good news is we're living longer than we ever have. The bad news is the number one associated risk for Alzheimer's disease is age. So here we are living in that, in that continuum. And as we continue to go, we see the uh, projections for people age 65 and over. One real important fact to know in terms of the aging brain is this. We have 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day. And if you follow that trajectory to its logical conclusion, we are looking at an aging boom that we've never seen before. So it's places like here, the Luruvo Center, that has to be on the cutting edge of looking at prevention and treatment and cures for these diseases of aging. So the brain. The brain is the part of the body that is the powerhouse. And the brain, like all of those other physiological parts of our body, has an aging process attached to it. But oftentimes, because we can't see our brain physically with our naked eyes, as, as we can our outers, we don't know the process of brain aging or how it ages or sometimes even how it affects us. And so this is where we find ourselves, but the brain has a precipitous aging process. So looking at the brain with the naked eye, we see what we know as a normal brain, which those squiggly things are called the gyri, and they're nicely tight together, and then we see a brain that has not aged well. And again, I want to underscore, Alzheimer's is not normal aging. It is not part of the normal aging continuum. And so we see brain atrophy, shrinkage of the brain, which starts this term called neurodegeneration. That was done at autopsy. This picture was taken at autopsy. Well, well, if, you can, if you can hold the questions till after, we'll, we'll address those questions. You got it. So, so looking at that, after the age of 40, what typically happens is we have normal brain atrophy. Your brain actually starts to lose volume after the age of 40, which is perfectly normal. It's part of the normal aging process. It gets accelerated based on a number of factors, which then starts to accelerate brain aging. But it starts normally to start reducing size after the age of 40, another cross-section of the brain. Now, this is an interesting slide that I want to be able to point out to you. And it shows, really, when Alzheimer's brain changes start and go along the normal aging continuum, which is that red line. And that's where we are in terms of normal aging. And if you look at the cognition or function curve, as you age, you will see aspects of your function and cognition start to become less. And that's part of the normal brain aging process. But if you have some other type of cognitive disease, Alzheimer's, for example, when you're clinically diagnosed, you'll start to see abnormal brain aging start to happen, and it manifests itself across the continuum. We're going to talk a little bit about the ways that abnormal brain um, aging starts to affect people. But at 40, when we start to see the brain changes happen, there are certain things, and we're going to, we're going to have a series of lectures that are going to deal with those, things that we can do to reduce our risk of abnormal brain aging. It's the same way that you can reduce your risk of abnormal aging in a lot of other ways. For example, women who want to prevent osteoporosis, which is abnormal um, aging for women, there are things that they can do to modify their risk or mitigate those. Brain aging, same type of thing. 
So this is what's happening. So as you age, your normal function will start to decline over a period of time. But the question that most people have is, well, what does normal look like then? What is normal, because that's why you guys are here, what does normal brain aging look like as opposed to abnormal brain aging? Because I will bet your lunch on the fact that all of you have these questions about, am I getting Alzheimer's or not? Or is, is my normal memory something more than that? And that's what people work and, and live in the, the shadow of that on a regular basis. So looking at the major areas of the brain, we see the fact that um, they're responsible for different aspects that we do every single day. And normal brain aging um, is affected by this, but also abnormal brain aging, all of these parts of our brain are affected in the aging process. Um, we start looking at even things like um, the way that we perceive our, our, our spatial abilities around us, depth perception, part of our visual, spatial, uh, cognitive domain. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. Sometimes I work in these age-restricted master plan communities where people live in bliss, and I drive there, <laughs> and I take my life in my own hands. <laughs> because all of a sudden, I will see some of these drivers with decreased visual spatial ability get right up on the bumper, or stay 20 car lengths back, or decide to ride over the curb, or something like that because of their visual spatial difficulty. And that is a part of the aging process, that your visual spatial ability does decrease. But abnormal brain aging, it starts to get worse. You know, I'll give you another example of what normal visual spatial um, brain aging looks like. Again, I will bet your lunch today that most of you get up at night to use the restroom. Right? That's not shocking to anybody, right? So what transpires is this. A number of us, most of us, will get up from a dead sleep in a dark room, make it to the restroom and back without even stubbing our toe, correct? That is your visual spatial ability already mapping out the route that you've taken many, many times and is able to deliver you there and back. Abnormal visual spatial means that you become a fall risk your visual spatial ability becomes diminished and you become a fall risk, which is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in America. Diminished visual spatial capacity. And that's part of an abnormal brain aging continuum. So let's take a look at how the brain develops. So let's start back before. The younger brains are far less developed than adults. Shocking, right? And, and the underdevelopment of these parts of the brains lead us to work with gut reaction because our brains aren't developed to know what's going on. And so we see a lot of increased impulsiveness. And so this is where, you know, younger people will engage in activities that older people will say is crazy, but they don't have the brain age or the experience to be able to make those decisions. And they're often emotionally based decisions. And so we look at this whole um, increased risk that goes with it, and they weigh risk differently because their brains are young. So we've seen this phenomenon play itself out all the time. You're in the grocery store, and you see a mom, and then you see a young child on the floor throwing a tantrum. We've all seen this, right? And then the mom tries to very hard to reason with this young child and tell about the benefits of everything that they should do to, to not throw this tantrum. The young, underdeveloped brain does not have the capacity to do what? Reason at that level, so it doesn't mean anything to them. But how many moms do you see continue to try? And so, so this is the, the, the looking at the development of brain, brain development. So we know full brain development happens at the age of 25. This is why responsibility to give in to people too young oftentimes doesn't work out in our favor. Because we know that there are influences on aging brains and brain development. And if the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25, sometimes we have to temper our expectations. And so as we age, there are other influences that, that can work on our brain aging. Things that we put into our body like alcohol and illicit drugs that, and their impact on the brain. 
So they can impact the way that our brains develop normally. And so again, um, we see that in, in certain types of dementia, as in terms of how it manifests itself as you get older, and in choices and decision makings during a, the younger years of your life. But what we do know in terms of how the brain ages and functions is this, that experience can change the actual structure of the brain. It really puts an imprint on what we do and the activity and the developmental aspect. And so it's like anything. The more reps of something you have, the more proficient you are. So therefore, we, adults are more proficient in a lot of um, cognitive areas than our younger folks. But then conversely, as you get older, you become less efficient in those same cognitive areas than, than younger folks. So there's a development and experience that goes along. And it's, an, it's architecture that's built over time. So we know that um, behavior and, and the development and the capacities are developed over that particular period of time. Then we have the phenomena of cognitive reserve, which is our ability to govern ourselves. So our body works on this principle all the time. It looks for the most efficient way to do anything. So in your course of you becoming more physically fit, you know, let's say, you know, gentleman or a lady wants to start lifting a 30-pound dumbbell every day and get their, start lifting a 30-pound dumbbell every day. What's going to happen is their, their bicep is going to have a demand for blood and there's going to be muscle built and it's going to be reacting to the stimuli. Your brain works the same way. The phenomena of cognitive reserve um, tells us that our brains constantly look to prune unused neuronal connections. So the more cognitively active you are, the more engaged your brain is. And so it's part of your brain development as well. So part of our brain health is to stay engaged and cognitively active and always learning. And so right now, your brains are excited. If we looked at your brains under a PET scan right now, we would see great metabolic activity because it's engaged, it's learning, it's doing all those things. And the more you do that, the more it strengthens your brain along the process. So it's really important in terms of the aging brain to stay engaged. The learning process and staying engaged actually will preserve your brain. And we're going to go into that in much more detail in, in further programs. But, but in terms of the development of your brain, the aging of your brain, this is an area that needs to be engaged. So we go back to this slide here, and we know that there are certain things that you can do in adolescence that interrupt normal brain aging. So for example, we know brain injury can do that brain injury, and we're, we're wrestling with that in professional sports. And even at this center, there is some studies going on right now that look at brain injury and brain aging. Uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, things along those lines that accelerate brain aging when you have trauma to the brain. You know, concussions, cluster concussions, things along those lines. Even from a young age, what do those have to say in terms of brain aging? So one of the ways that we can make sure that we're aging well is to protect our brain. To protect our brain. And that's within our control for the most part. And so for you wives in the crowd, you're going to have to stop hitting your husbands across the head so that you can preserve their brain aging. So brain aging is... Brain aging um, is directly dependent on, again, trauma and things along those lines. So the brain does slow down with age. It slows down with age. The neurons do fire more slowly, and, and messages sent aren't as quick. And more, many life processes become more difficult because of that. And it's OK. That's a normal aspect. It's not firing as fast. And it's the same reason why you can't run as fast at 65 as you can as when you were 25, because these processes become a little slower over time. And that's OK. The, the key is that your brain is still working and working hard. So I always get the, the questions, like I said, so, so what does normal brain aging look like, and what is it, when is it something more? So you know, I devised a little, a little chart to kind of go over that. 
So what normal brain aging looks like is this, slower thinking with occasional mistakes. That's normal brain aging. But then when it's something more, slower thinking with added confusion leading to mistakes, frustration, and withdrawal, that's when we start to get to abnormal brain aging. And then how many of us have had a word on the tip of our tongue and all of a sudden it goes away? Is it just me? No? No? Okay. Or, or when you start talking around a word, you forget a word and you start talking around it, but you can still keep the flow of the conversation and people still understand. Or, you know, you're, you're, you're going and you're engaging in a, in a conversation and all of a sudden you're like a deer in the headlights because, because you've forgotten the next, the next thing. You know, all of those things or delay and recall of the fact that you've walked into a room and all of a sudden you say, what the heck am I in here for? You know? So everybody take a deep breath. That's all normal. Okay, there you go. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's all normal. Because those are the questions that people ask because that happens on a regular basis. What's more is when the names and words don't come back. So all of a sudden, I can't remember the word for chair. I can't remember that word or all of a sudden the, the repetitiveness and everything like that and increased forgetfulness, it just doesn't come back. Now, here's a phenomenon that happens to a lot of people. All of a sudden I'm golfing and I see a guy that I've known for 25 years on the golf course and oh my goodness, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name, and it escapes me at that moment and I've known him for 25 years. But then at the tee at the next, home, next hole I say, oh, that's John, that's John, okay and it comes back to you. That's perfectly normal. It's when all of a sudden John's name does not come back to you, is a little something more. And then all of us forget things, right? Misplace things. We misplace things all the time. I do it all the time. Misplacing things is nothing to worry about, but it's the context of where you find the things that you misplace. That's the issue. So it's okay to misplace some keys and then you find them in the junk drawer or you find them, you know, sometimes still in the car ignition, you know. But when you find your keys in the freezer or the shower, that's a completely different context which suggests that you're putting them in an inappropriate place. And so this is what we see when it's something more that people will hoard and put things in odd places. But simply misplacing your keys or things like that, not an issue. We all do it. And that's a product of something else that we're going to talk about in another lecture at another time. As we age, we have our brain loses the ability to multitask. And guess what? We fight that. We fight this ability to multitask all the time because we go back to our younger selves when we were office managers or whatever, managing multiple priorities, and, and we go there. But multitasking is a fast way to look foolish. Because what happens, well, <laughs> what happens is this. There's multiple stimuli competing for the memory centers of your brain. And when you're getting this flood of multiple stimuli asking for your attention and your brain has to then remember all of this information, how much do you think your brain's going to be able to remember as you age? Snippets, bits and pieces of this, but you're, you're, it's going to make you look foolish because when you're asked a question, you're not going to be able to respond. So let me give you a typical scenario around homes in the United States of America. Husband is on the couch watching Sports Center and wife has something very important she wants to tell him while he's in the middle of watching sports. He's only half paying attention, right? And she's having this important conversation with him. And then, an hour later, she says, okay, so this is what we're going to do, and he is like a deer in the headlights. Say what? What? Because there was multiple stimuli competing for the memory centers of his brain at that point in time. So he could not succinctly remember. And then the wife says, you were right there when I said this to you. How can you not remember this? But that's what multitasking can do. So if you want to deliver a message with better chances of being remembered, 
you have to use what we call focus sustained attention, where the TV has to come off and it has to be at a time where it's appropriate because aging brains are not able to multitask like younger brains. It's just a product of, of that. Now, when it's something more, we get this full-on difficulty following simple tasks. So you'll give somebody a set of instructions and even a singular set of instructions becomes more difficult to follow over time. That's something a little more. And then it takes a little longer to learn new information. And so as you age, the aging brain will take a little longer to learn new information, and that's okay. So if you all of a sudden start to reminisce and go back to, you know, say, Christmas or, or Hanukkah 2018, you go back in time, and there was an 85-year-old grandmother and an 18-year-old granddaughter at the same event. Their memories of that event are going to be a little different. You're going to see a little more of a robust memory from the 18-year-old than you are the 85-year-old grandmother. But the good news is, although it takes some more time to learn new information and, and create those memories, it's okay because you have that ability. It's just a product of an aging brain. And then conversely, when we see someone who was at every occasion and so on and so forth, and they have an inability to learn new information. And that inability to learn new information could be from simple to the complex. And very simply put, I've, I've seen this happen many times. So on the way in here, let's say somebody asked me, well, Brian, what's for lunch today at this event? And I told them a turkey sandwich and fruit salad. Five minutes later, they say, Brian, what's for lunch at this event? And I say, a turkey sandwich and fruit salad. Yet five minutes later, they say, Brian, what's for lunch today? And this time, I'm not so happy when I say a turkey sandwich and fruit salad, right? And that, that's, that's caregivers, right? Caregivers get frustrated because of what? An inability to do what? Learn new information. So what that causes is there's a decrease in memory formation efficiency. When your memory formation efficiency starts to wane, it tells us a story. It tells the story that it may be time for additional evaluation, that your brain may be abnormally aging because your memory formation efficiency. Because remember, it may take you a little bit more time and you may not remember all the details, but the good news is as the brain ages, you're still in the game. You're still in the game. And so that's a product of memory. So when it's something more, it takes on a different connotation. So our brains age and some of the functions that we do change as well. So what we know is this complicated slide here. And we see all sorts of things, um, all sorts of things that will start to decline as we age. Um, but there's a phenomena of what we call um, crystallized intelligence that actually improve as you age with a lot of things on the decline, but, but, but crystallized intelligence actually improves. And so what is crystallized intelligence, you ask, right? That's your next question. So let's take a look at what crystallized intelligence is. It's a task that tap into well-learned skills, language, and all of those things. That actually gets better as you age over time. Verbal meaning, word association, social judgment, all of those things actually improve with age, which is a great thing. Some of the other things, like we said, start to decrease, but in terms of looking at brain aging, normal brain aging, is that they have the ability to maintain over a period of time, which is really good news. There's a research complicated slide here that talks about the theory of brain aging and cognition. I'm not really going to get into it, but it talks about really how the whole matrix works in terms of how the brain works. And the key thing is, what are the things that we can do to improve our brain functioning. And we look at the top, new learning, social, intellectual, engagement, exercise, cognitive training, meditation, things along those lines that we're going to learn about in, in, as the six pillars of brain health. All of those are important aspects that will influence brain aging and cognition. So this is good news. There are things that we can do to influence better brain aging and better cognition. So that's the good news. Today is the first step of many steps that we're going to take to be able to improve our brain aging and cognition. 
Stress influences our brain architecture. Stress is a big, big downfall to the way that we live our lives. So there's a couple things I wish for everybody. One is, I wish that your money outlives you, and I wish that your memories, your brains, outlive you too, your cognition. Those are the things that I wish for everybody. But one of the things that threaten is stress, this whole notion of stress, because uh, we're going to get into it in more detail when we talk about it in other lectures, but this is something that needs to be controlled because that will accelerate brain aging. It, it accelerates physiological aging too. And if you don't believe me, take a look at you know, past presidents before they started office and then after. You know, stress really influences physiological and brain aging. So we always want to mitigate stress, and we'll talk more about that at another time. So modifiable risk factors for cognitive decline. This is that brain aging piece. This is the, the big thing. So things that will increase your risk of cognitive decline, brain injury, the, the whole head trauma thing, midlife obesity, believe it or not, midlife hypertension, smoking, diabetes, depression, sleep di disturbances, and hyperlipidemia is like high cholesterol. Those are the things that increase your risk. But there are things that decrease your risk as well, so we're focusing on the good things. You know, the more you educate yourself and stay engaged, you actually decrease your risk. Physical activity, eating healthy, cognitive training, moderate al alcohol consumption, and social engagement. We were created to be in community, to live in community. So the fact that this is social engagement, one, you're learning new information and you're doing it in a social setting. Your brains are dancing right now. They're really being stimulated. And the more that you do this, the more you stimulate and decrease your risk. Because that's what we're all here to do. How do we basically live our best lives? And so we've, we've got some research that also tells us that we, with physical exercise, we change the function of our brains. We improve. With, str with strategy-based training, we improve our brain function. With process-specific training, we improve all of our brain function. The research is out there that we can look to change the way that our brain works in ages. Just the same way, physiologically, you can do that. So let me give you an, uh, an example of what is what. So longevity and aging oftentimes get used the same way, but they're not. They're two different things. Longevity is the actual years that, of life, but aging is a rate at how you age, how you age. And I'll give you an example of this. I can bring two 80-year-olds right up here to the front, and you will see those 80-year-olds look completely different because they have different rates of aging. We can control our rates of aging by certain modifiable things that we do. So the way we age is more under control, and it will affect longevity. So this is where brain aging comes in. We have to impact our brain so that we can, we can age appropriately and not inappropriately over time. So here are some things that change over time and don't change over time in terms of brain aging. Your verbal IQ doesn't change as you age, and your vocabulary. So let me give you an example of that. A retired nurse at however years old, 85 years old, is still going to understand the jargon and the vocabulary of nursing. So if somebody said, push 20 cc's of calcium stat, the retired nurse knows exactly what that means. A retired engineer still knows that. So things like that don't change. Your store of information and your comprehension. If you're 100 years old, and I'm speaking right now, you're still comprehending what I'm saying. Those things don't change. But there's certain things that do change and they decrease, and this is all normal. So the things that do decrease is the speed of memory retrieval. It may take you a few beats longer to retrieve a memory. So when I say think back at Christmas or Hanukkah 2018, it takes you a few extra beats to go back in your, the annals of your mind and pull that memory out. That's perfectly normal, because that decreases as you age. And then the speed of processing also decreases. So let me give you a, a little bit of an example of processing speed. 
Do you guys remember in the 1980s when computers became in vogue, when they just sort of, that was the golden age of computers? And a company called Intel was the, was the master of making processing chips. Now, all processing chips are, are these chips that allow you to push the enter button and hit and do a function, but that function allows it to come faster on the screen. So the faster the processing chip, the faster the function actually happens on the computer. So Intel created the, the first Pentium chip. Do you guys remember that? The Pentium chip. And then there was a Pentium 1 chip and a Pentium 2 chip and a Pentium 3 chip, and it kept on getting faster and faster in the processing speed. So I like to tell people who are a little older, they're the original Pentium chip. They're the original Pentium chip. They're not the fast supercomputers of today. They're the original Pentium chip. So when they press the return button, they may see the hourglass for a little while before the information springs up on the screen. And oftentimes we compare ourselves to those big fancy computers, right? But that's, you're a Pentium chip. Be happy that you're a Pentium chip. And here's, here's the difference, though. The good news is it may take a little longer because you have an original Pentium chip for the information to appear on the screen. But the good news is it's appearing on the screen. When you have Alzheimer's or some other cognitive difficulty, it wipes out the hard drive. And you can press the Enter button all you want. There's no memory on the hard drive. So nothing will ever come up. So even though your processing speed is diminished, it's OK. It's just a product of brain aging. We talked about multitasking ability and memory formation efficiency. Those things do decrease as you age, as a normal part of aging. So, so normal brain aging, you can still function and do your thing. Again, there are things that you can do in your life right now that improve your rate of aging. Because remember, I told you, your rate of aging is controlled by factors that you can start to, to do. So we know that this senescence is, is, a, is a part where we start to see how things age over time. And one of the things that we see in terms of full-on aging and part of brain aging is things that come into play, our senses, and some more than others. So we go through this whole phenomena of seeing age-related diseases of parts of our body. For example, our eyes age-related macular degeneration, cataract, glaucoma, all is a product of what? Aging. All of a product of aging. And we see things like hearing and, and, and things like that. Those start to decline over a period of time. And, and again, the inability to recall certain things because of the aging process of those sensory responses. A lot of people don't realize this straight fact. You can't remember what you don't see and what you don't hear. Many people have been given categories of pseudo-dementia based on the fact that it was really their hearing or their vision. So for example, if I was, if I was mumbling, mumbling like this and so on and had a, test, had a test afterwards to say, how much did you learn, but you couldn't hear me, how do you think you're going to do well on that test? You're not, because you couldn't hear. Hearing then becomes an issue and so on and so forth. So as you age, hearing and sight become these mitigating factors that have to be addressed as part of the normal aging process. So I always recommend making sure as you age, you get your vision and hearing checked regularly because that will affect your rate of aging as well. We talked about perceptual deficits and things along those lines with our visual, spatial, and we become light sensitive and all of those types of things. And so think about this. Your brain processing starts to decrease, like I said before. And if somebody speaks really fast, guess what somebody who is aging can't do? They can't keep up with the conversation because their processing is a little slower. So we really have to retrain society as that number keeps on growing. Like I said, 10,000 baby boomers every day are turning 65. So we have to adjust the way that we do business with brain aging to be able to accommodate our population. So if I was speaking really, really quickly, I would probably lose half of everybody in here. 
if I was speaking really, really quietly, I'd lose the other half. Just like that. So these perceptual deficits are a part of the aging process. And so why is recognition important? And recognition is important because of this. 5.1 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease and climbing because of population statistics. A new case every 72 seconds, one in eight people over 65 and one in two over 85. This is serious business, but we can reduce our risk. Brain aging is a normal process, but we want to go through a normal brain aging process as opposed to abnormal brain aging. And one of the most arresting statistics is this. 50% are never diagnosed. 50% of people are never diagnosed because people will attribute this to, oh, they're just getting older. They're just getting older. So to us here, that's an unacceptable way to look at this. We know that you can have normal brain aging to last and match your years. It's going to take some effort on your part. We'll provide the education, but you provide the effort on your part. But you can live as well as you can. And when there are signs of abnormal aging, guess who's here to help you? Right here. The Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center is here to help in that aspect of things. So we know that this is important. The other aspect is this. We want you to become a better brain ager. Not a, not a better teenager or anything like that, but a better brain ager. So we want you to inquire about clinical research that's happening because clinical research is the future. It is the future. It's tomorrow's medicine today. It is the latest advances in everything that we do. It is so important. And being a part of that, you have an opportunity to be a hero, for one. And nothing ever developed in medical science Nothing was ever done without it going through a clinical trial process. Some of you folks are on high blood pressure medication right now. Some of you are on heart medication right now. There had to be a robust clinical trial process for you to be on those medications, reducing your risk right now for heart disease. And so with Alzheimer's disease, there's some really great things happening in research. And the only thing missing is you folks to participate. So the inquiry into clinical trials is the first step into basically letting you know how we can defeat this. Let me tell you a little story about the 19, early 1980s. Early 1980s, late 70s, HIV was a death sentence to anybody that got it. Terminal disease. There was an unprecedented amount of research funding and research done in the field of HIV that in one generation, HIV change from a terminal disease to now a chronic manageable disease. People aren't dying from HIV anymore. One generation research. The same can be possible here with Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease is the most feared disease for people over the age of 60. Research is the portal for all of that. And we also want you to plug into these events here. We're going to be doing events here at the center and out in the community to give you everything you need to stay brain healthy and to point you in the direction of clinical trials. And you become our ambassadors doing that. So our job is for you to stay as engaged as you can. We'll provide the education. We'll provide the clinic. We just need you guys to be part of our team. So you guys are ambassadors in that aspect. So I am going to stop here, um, and uh, we are going to then have a question and answer period. Um, I believe it's Kat around. Oh, here she is. She's coming up, and she's going to give the, uh, the format for our question and answer period. So it's been my pleasure to be able to talk to you right now about this, and I look forward to being in front of you guys again in the, uh, in the real near future. Wasn't that wonderful? Yes. Um, so I'm going to have my wonderful volunteers walk around and collect all of your cards. Um,
that you may have written down a question for. And um, while they do that, if you've ever been to one of my lectures, I want everyone to stand up. Can we all stand up? All right, and let's just wiggle around, stretch your bodies. As Brian mentioned, moving helps us in the aging process, correct? Yes, all right, have a good shoulder roll. Very good, we've been sitting for a long time. Now, I want you to put your hands up on your ears like you gotta hear something very important. Sitting is the new smoking. <laughs> All right, sitting is bad for you. Okay, so we need to stand up every 30 minutes and remember to move. That wonderful parking space you had right up front, look for the one a few rows to the back. Okay, and just encourage more movement in your life. Um, this will be a wonderful tip for aging. All right, so now sit down. <laughs> All right, I'd love to um, introduce to you our, a wonderful person here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Aaron Ritter. Uh, he is a neurologist, a behavioral psychiatrist, is this right, <laughs> a psychologist? Um, anyway, he uh, is a tra treating physician here at the clinic, but he also is the director of clinical trials. And as we mentioned, one of our missions is to become one of the answers, the place where hopefully we can find a cure. Um, and the first person to experience a cure for dementia or any of the diseases we treat will have been in a clinical trial. Um, so. We have questions that you can ask of uh, Dr. Ritter. The doctor is in. <laughs> doctor is and we have questions for Brian as well. So bring them forward or you can hand them to one of our volunteers. All right. You have started? some great questions. There appears to be some doctors in the audience because <laughs> we can't read all of the handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys should be able to answer your own questions. So I just all right, we'll start with a, a, really, a, a really great question, and that's how do we get into a clinical trial? Uh, and so, so uh, there are multiple ways, and, and we're, we're doing research and we're doing clinical trials. The difference between a clinical trial and research uh, is that in a clinical trial, we're, we, we're testing whether a new medicine um, can help or, or treat a symptom in a neurologic disease. So we have clinical trials, and. MS and Parkinson's, Huntington's, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease. So we have so a fair number of clinical trials and research studies that are going on. The best way to, to learn about our clinical trial program is to sign up for our Healthy Brains uh, Research Registry. So we have the opportunity to sign up and learn more about the clinical trials that we have available. Uh, we have a telephone number as well, but I think the best way is through the Healthy Brains website, and then um, if you're interested, we can provide some information about specific trials. Uh, the second question is, how can we become a patient here? And that's also a really good question. So uh, traditionally, we have referrals from primary care doctors as our source where patients become patients here, and the reason we have to do that is because we, we, we're very specialized in what we do, and it's really imperative that we work with your primary care doctor to provide your care. So we really ask that folks, if they want to be a patient here, that they get a referral from their doctor. If that's hard to do, if your primary care doctor doesn't know how to do that or it's, it's taking a long time, please just call our main number, uh, but we try to work with our primary care doctors. Okay, uh, I've got a question here that says, with Alzheimer's on the rise, how do you account for people living longer? So longevity is a, a product of a lot of research. So for example, when we were able to incorporate things like antibiotics, uh, the flushing toilet, and things along those lines, we continue to expand longevity. Alzheimer's is a disease of aging that is both debilitating and a terminal disease. Um, we're getting better at diagnosing it. But looking at our overall general numbers, uh, Alzheimer's does play a part in premature death 
because it is uh, abnormal aging, but the longevity boom goes well beyond Alzheimer's disease, that we're making advances in, in things like I just mentioned, that whole HIV continuum where people are able to live longer. So longevity is a product of so many other things. Alzheimer's disease does threaten it in your older age, um, but overall, we do have the distinct pleasure of living longer because of the ad advance in, uh, in research that we hope that you guys avail yourselves of. Okay. What is on the horizon re regarding pharmaceutical treatment? So that's a really great question, and I think uh, people that may be following this closely know that over the past two years, we've had uh, four different medications that were tested to treat Alzheimer's disease fail, and that was really disappointing. All of those medications targeted a protein called amyloid. We know that amyloid uh, in the brain is a sign of Alzheimer's disease. And in those trials, even though there was an effect on the amyloid protein, it actually didn't s help symptoms very much. So the question is, is amyloid the target to help people's memory when they develop Alzheimer's disease? And we still don't know the answer to that question. It seems to be maybe not, that amyloid itself is not causing the problem. So if you attack amyloid, you're not going to get an improvement. We don't know because these trials are very relatively short-lived. Um, so there are over 130 different medications being tested to see if it, they help the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We're doing a, a number of them here. And so there are a lot on the horizon. We're learning every day from each trial that we conduct. Even if it's not positive, we, we learn something new from it. Um, so the, the, the pipeline for Alzheimer's disease therapy is pretty strong. It's moving toward earlier and earlier, so early diagnosis, even prevention. So um, there are a bunch of different targets. The tau protein is one that can be targeted, inflammation in the brain, um, and some other f factors uh, like that. So, so the, the pipeline is, is strong, even though there has been failures. There hasn't been a new medication approved for Alzheimer's disease f for the past 18 years. So um, we're, we're hoping to find that new treatments will, will be effective. The good news about what Dr. Ritter just said is we're, through this research, we're finding out the answers. And so that's what research does, is it gives us the, a roadmap and finds answers. Um, question, uh, my mom was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she's going into depression. Is this a normal part of Alzheimer's? And to answer that question, yes. Um, depression is highly intertwined with the disease itself and actually can accelerate um, memory loss as well within the disease process itself. So even when we do um, cognitive memory screenings on just the general communities, some things that we like to, to do is do what we call a GDS or geriatric depression screening, which will give us an indication sometimes whether the memory loss is um, focused on depression or is it an actual you know, memory loss. And so depression, there is a, a correlation between that and Alzheimer's disease, and it does accelerate uh, memory loss within the disease itself. Yeah, I think the other thing to, to say about depression in Alzheimer's disease is this uh, condition we, we, we see that's related to depression is actually apathy. So it's very common for somebody that's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or having changes in the brain related to a neurologic disease to lose interest in doing things. So loss of interest in hobbies, loss of um, going f interest in food or preparing meals and things of that nature. And that's often perceived as depression, but depression requires the, the mood to be sad. So apathy is a very common symptom in, in neurologic disease. And the treatment for apathy is not antidepressants, but it's actually getting the person out and doing activities. So, so not taking no for an answer, going to the movie, preparing meals, doing things like that. So that's, that's also something to take into consideration. I have a question about vascular dementia. So vascular dementia refers to the fact that when the dementia is not caused by degeneration of the neurons, like what happens in Alzheimer's disease, but damage to the blood vessels. So we know that the vascular system in the body and the brain is highly interconnected, and, and when a person has damage to the arteries, hardening of the arteries in the heart, they're likely to have damage to some of the arteries in the brain. And when the damage we think is due primarily to the blood vessels, we call that vascular dementia. The good news about vascular dementia is that we know 
pretty well how to prevent it from getting worse, and that is through lifestyle modification. So the same, same thing that your cardiologist will tell you about treating the blood vessels in your heart are the thing, same things that we say about treating the blood vessels in the brain. So that's activity. So physical exercise, controlling blood pressure, reducing cholesterol, um, quitting smoking, um, all those things can have a, a pretty big impact on the course of vascular dementia. So I have a question about cholesterol and, and brain health and, and Alzheimer's. And uh, the question uh, intimates that, um, thought that there was a need for the brain to have cholesterol, so why is cholesterol bad for the brain? And so there are different types of cholesterol in terms of HDL and LDL cholesterol and circulating cholesterol. And uh, Dr. Ritter mentioned uh, that whole uh, cardiac risk in terms of controlling your cholesterol. Uh, being a positive risk factor um, for preventing Alzheimer's disease. And so the, the LDL cholesterol is your bad cholesterol, and you want to always have a total cholesterol under 200. Right. Um, I have a comment, of, and it's more of a comment than a question, but I think it's an important one. It's the Lewy body disease. So our friend has it. It's very complicated, and I think that's um, certainly my experience, and we know that Lewy body disease is probably the second most common form of neurologic disease in, in elderly folks. And I would say this, that Alzheimer's is a condition that affects memory. Parkinson's is a condition that affects movement. And then we have in between Lewy body disease, which affects both memory and also physical symptoms as well. So it's, it's when a person has both memory problems and Parkinson's at the same time. And one of the symptoms that people get in Lewy body disease is hallucinations. So they often will see things, usually animals or people in the house, typically at night. People will act out their dreams and then they will start to move a lot slower and have some changes in their memory. So it's a very common condition. We were lucky enough in, in June to have the first international consortium meeting for Lewy body disease at uh, Caesars Palace. Uh, it was here this summer and it was a great conference and we're, we're working on finding uh, solutions for Lewy body disease as well. It's something that we treat here and we have two clinical trials um, addressing Lewy body disease that are coming up. So we're, we're Lewy body disease is an under-recognized phenomenon but it's uh, also very similar to Alzheimer's disease. So I've got a question. Do I think in this age of cell phone entertainment and uh, really sedentary living, uh, people not being cognitively active, do we think the disease will become more prevalent? So we do know that you do reduce your risk for this disease by staying active um, mentally, cognitively, and so we do want to engage our brains. And so if someone is staying cognitively inactive by what they're doing, they, they will have a larger risk potentially of developing uh, cognitive decline as time goes by. So again, we're going to be doing some other programming that will address that specifically uh, and, and really engage that right there. Um, and the piggyback question here, does reading help? Yeah, reading actually does help the brain. So it is active learning as opposed to passive learning. So think about it this way. A good author, when you read a book, will go through character development. They'll say the dark-haired man leapt on the table and started to do the twists with Charlie Checker's music and playing in the background, <laughs> right? So when you're reading that, you have to picture what? A dark-haired gentleman doing what? Jumping on the table and doing what? The twist. And it exercises your brain as you read it, as opposed to just sitting there and watching it all play out on TV. So you really, it's a part of cognitive engagement. So yes, reading is absolutely good for cognitive engagement. All right, I got, I, I got a good question here. This is one we get a lot. Um, and that's about products like Prevagen. <laughs> so Prevagen is uh, very commonly advertised uh, during the nightly news. It's very common on uh, our TV. And uh, I think the thing to know about Prevagen is that it's, a, it's been classified as a medical food, so there's no rigorous testing that goes into 
whether Prevagen actually works. It's Prevagen, this, the, the company itself was actually banned by the FDA for several years because of the, the claims that they were making. So they actually had to tone down the claims that they're making now, which I can't, I can't imagine that they're greater than they were before. Um, so we don't know if Prevagen works. They say clinical trials, but we don't know who those clinical trials are being tested at. I think the flash is on the screen and there's an arrow going upward. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty convincing, but, but we haven't seen any of the studies. So um, the medicines that we prescribe for Alzheimer's disease and the medicines that go through our clinical trial process are very rigorous in terms of establishing metrics, in terms of showing that a, a product is, is effective. Prevagen essentially goes through the same process as uh, getting an avocado on the table. I mean, it's, it, it's not being tested for any, any benefit. So I would say to you, if, if and, and the other thing about Prevagen is it's the, they claim that there's something called an aquaporin, which is a water channel, and there's some data to suggest that that aquaporins are broken down by the stomach acid. So we have no uh, biochemical information that Prevagen is getting into the brain or, or that it's doing anything. So they have a very slick marketing campaign. So I tell people there's no, we don't think there's a harm in this. It's already proven to be safe. We don't know if it works. You're willing to try it, but every, every pill that is purchased for Prevage and may, may be going to the CEO's uh, new uh, house in Malibu. So, <laughs> so, I, private jet. So, so, I, so I'm thinking that it's, it's, it's not such a, a great product in terms of efficacy, but it's safe. Um, I've had a bunch of people try it, and I don't think anybody has ever gone past three months, even with the extra strength Prevagen, which is $10 more. So <laughs> this is a great question. How do you know what is a senior moment versus something more serious? That's a, I think that's a great question, and I think that's the thing that challenges us as the physicians here at the, at the Brain Center, and we, we, we all know that having little lapses in our memory or having that word that's just out of reach or having that day where you can't recall the names of our friends even though we've known them for a long time. I think we, we all have that, and I, I think that's just, that's, those become more common as we as we get older and, and things like pain and, and poor sleep and sedentary lifestyle kind of comes into play and as the blood vessels get a little bit more uh, uh, diseased. Um, for me, I think the big difference is the function. If the senior moments are getting in the ability of a, getting in the way of a person's ability to function independently, so missing appointments, getting lost while driving, um, um, not being able to pay the bills regular on a consistent basis. So when it becomes affecting of functioning, that's when we get a little bit more, more worried about it. If there's any question at all, though, that's, that's what I, I picture my job as. And what we use now is we use more sophisticated diagnosis um, techniques, such as the MRI scan and a PET scan and memory testing to help us to distinguish that. This. So this is the primary thing that we do here. So if there's any concern at all, um, we can make an appointment and we could check that, check that out. Great question. So um, next question here is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia and the relationship of them all? And so we look at the term dementia as a category of disease, a category of disease with different types of diseases that fall under it. Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. Subsequently, all 70% of all dementia is attributed to Alzheimer's, but there are 70 differential diagnoses of types of dementia. So think of the way that we use the term dementia as a category of diseases like we use the term cancer. All cancer means the same thing. It means there's a deviant growth of cells in your body, but there's different types of cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, but it's all cancer. Dementia, diminishing cognition, um, that shows that there is um, there's trouble in memory and thinking, et cetera, but there's different types of dementia that fall under the category of dementia. Vascular dementia, like Dr. Ritter said, uh, frontal temporal dementia, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, different types of dementias, but Alzheimer's is a form of dementia and the most common form of dementia. And a follow-up um, question to that was, um, are we seeing uh, Alzheimer's affect younger people? And there is a younger cohort that does 
come down with these symptoms, but typically it is a disease of aging, and age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. I think I had a, a follow-up on that is I had a question about why do you see a family with siblings and a parent all with Alzheimer's yet one person doesn't get it? That's a really, really good question, and I, I think it leads back into the, the, the pr previous question, which is that we know that these are these, all these dementias are very complicated, and genetics are only one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's, and it's likely the interaction between our genes and the environment that produces the disease. So there is a form of Alzheimer's disease that's very rare, and it's, it's in certain families where people get the disease when they're in their 30s and 40s. Uh, people have seen the, the, sh the documentation of that family on 60 Minutes, I think it was probably in January. There's a family in um, Medellin, Colombia. Col Colombia yeah. that you can go back in the records, and this is how they determined that the priest in the town uh, had documented the, f the families developing softening of the brain dating back 300 years, so it, it hits every generation. But people get that disease when they're in their 30s and 40s. The version of Alzheimer's disease that we're all at risk for is the, is the age-related form. And genetics, like I said, are only a small part of it. Um, we do know that there are certain genes that predispose a person's risk. So genes are only risk in Alzheimer's disease. So even if you have the highest gene risk, it's the ApoE4 genotype. If you have two of those, if you are unlucky enough to get one from your mom and one from your dad, it's about 5% of the population. Your lifetime risk of getting Alzheimer's disease is still only 25 to 50%. So genes aren't the only thing that are involved in this disease. So it has to be lifestyle. It has to be something in our environment. Um, so genes are not the determining factor when it comes to Alzheimer's disease age is, is likely the, the more important factor. So we do see this a lot. We see families that have, everybody's affected and they never develop the disease. We have families where there's, there's no one affected and a person gets the disease. So it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than just the transmission generation to generation. And there is a follow-up question here about do genes affect the rate of aging? Uh, Physiological aging, um, your genes can play a, a role in physiological aging, and uh, aging and longevity, like I said before, are two different constructs, uh, but yet yeah, genes do play a role in physiological aging. So uh, I have a, a couple questions about sleep and insomnia. Okay. So somebody that only sleeps four hours in the crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the president, I think this is the president, doesn't the president do something like that? Anyway, so, so uh, everybody's clock is a little bit different, and I think uh, there is a predisposition to uh, heavy sleepers versus mild sleepers, um, and the, the sleep is highly related to the risk for dementia, but it's primarily when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea. So uh, there is a very common condition, unfortunately, of the windpipe actually uh, losing the integrity as we get older. So the effects of weight, the effects of aging, the effects of the way we sleep. If a person is a back sleeper versus a side sleeper, back being more likely to obstruct the airway. And if we don't get enough oxygen during our sleep, we wake up and we never get to the deepest stage of sleep. And there's been studies that show just one poor night of sleep can increase the proteins that we th are are seen with associated with Alzheimer's disease. So obstructive sleep apnea is a very common condition. It's poorly treated, right? It's the mask, it's the CPAP machine. But it has been definitively been associated with uh, memory loss. I have patients in my clinic that I have were for sure thought that they have Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out they just had severe, severe sleep apnea. We treat their sleep apnea. They feel a lot better their memory performs a lot better, and we reduce the risk for developing dementia. So sleep is important. It's not so much the time, it's the quality of sleep. And everybody's a little bit different, so I would encourage people to kind of stick with the normal routine, that their routine is not changing throughout the week, that they're getting the same amount of sleep. There's another question about, is it okay to have an afternoon nap? Yes, that's, that's completely appropriate, but that could also be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea. So if there's a lot of napping, people falling asleep, 
at the stoplight or things of that nature. It's likely a sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Or at our lecture. Or at a lecture. <laughs> I, and I, I, my next question here, I, I really don't know the answer, and maybe Dr. Ritter does. Can shock treatments back in the 1950s contribute to dementia or Alzheimer's disease? No, that's a really good question. I think um, the thing about uh, shock treatments is a lot of the electroconvulsive therapies from the 50s were due to the fact we didn't have really good treatments for depression. And we still know that to this day that ECT or electroconvulsive uh, therapy is the most effective treatment for depression. So it's still being used, especially for refractory treatments of uh, depression. So it, it's, a, it's a safe and effective therapy. We just don't do it very much because people respond to medications. We do know that lifetime risk of depression, so the more often stress and depression we have in our life, also increases our list, risk for dementia. So I think opposite way to look at that, I would think if the treatments for depression reduce your risk for developing dementia in later life. So I don't think there's any data to suggest that shock therapy itself increases mm -hmm. risk, risk for dementia. A side effect of ECT, though, is memory loss, but it's usually tran transitive and, and it usually goes away. So I actually think I would look at it as a, a re reduction in risk. Good. Oh, gosh, we've got some oh. good questions here. I'm, I'm, I'm done with mine. You're done? With, yeah. You want to steal yeah. some? I want to steal some. <laughs> <laughs> you get, we'll give you some hard ones. Oh, here. boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. A question about ADHD and dementia. Wow. That's a good one. So I think, um, uh, I think this is a hard one to answer. So ADHD, is, as we know, is a sim syndrome of symptoms. So syndrome meaning a collection of symptoms. It's much more commonly diagnosed now particularly in the last 20 years. I don't know that's associated with the fact that we have treatments for it now, and, and, and when we have a treatment, it's much more likely to be diagnosed and the you know, drug companies and things of that nature. Um, I don't know of any relationship between ADHD and dementia. It's something we ferret out when we're trying to do the memory testing, because certainly people that have ADHD have poor memories or poor attention. Memory requires attending to a stimulus before you before you can consolidate it. So we have a lot of spouses who say, I don't know if he's just not paying attention or he has a memory problem. <laughs> it's usually not paying attention. So um, you can have selective ADHD. Um, that's a really good question. I think the research is getting to that. But I think until we attend to a stimulus, until you're fully paying attention to what you're trying to remember, you can't remember something. We have people that come into our center and they do a long battery of memory tests with our neuropsychologist can take up to f three hours and it comes back normal and a person says I can't believe it's normal and I said all it shows is that in a quiet room focused on one thing at one time you can do the memory testing and that's valuable to us so it says because people with dementia can't do that it's just a bar that they can't do and so people say well I still have a memory problem I said yes that's true but the problem may be that you have a cell phone and you've got four different activities that you're involved in. You're picking up your grandkids at, at soccer and dropping another grandchild off at dance and you've got ten different things going on at once and you've got the computer up. So uh, ADHD and dementia are, are two separate entities but they can certainly overlap. And I think the thing I tell people is when you do really good on our memory test here but you're, you're not noticing you're doing very good in the community to simplify and to make your life as routine as possible so you can be kind of on autopilot because there's a lot of people that just function on autopilot. So uh, I got a question here was, was, which was a product of one of the slides I had up there when I had the continuum of aging, normal aging with dementia and then there was a category called super aging and wanted to know the difference between what a super ager versus normal aging is. So super agers are outliers. They're people who basically live to advanced age but sometimes will buck some of the risk factors for some of the comorbidities that we talk about. And all of us kind of like to romanticize and think that we are a super Asia because we typically have one somewhere in our gene pool. That one person who smoked a pack of cigarettes a day 
drank a fifth of gin, ate salt pork, never exercised a day, dropped dead at 110, and was cognitively intact. And you think back to that person in your gene pool, and you always say that that's going to be me. And I'm here to say it's not going to be you. <laughs> it's not going to be you. Um, actuarial tables don't lie. Our insurance companies have been betting against us and know exactly when you're going to die based on the information that you tell them. Whether it is you have moving violations in your car and you like to speed, speeding is a product of, of potential accidents and premature death. Whether your cholesterol levels are out of control or you have uncontrolled diabetes, all of those come into the confluence of basically how we're going to age. So super agers are a little bit of an outlier. We are living longer with the advent of the way that we can intervene in terms of uh, keep people healthy, one on the preventative side, but also treat disease. But, um, but super aging is that, that outlier that everybody kind of strives for. But you know, realistically, we just need to manage our risk for all of these comorbidities and we'll all you know, potentially be on the way of having a great quality of life and the years that attach to it. I've got a great question here. It's, uh, and this is something that I think we, I don't have a great solution for, but I don't know, maybe Kat can weigh in on this as well. Uh, so my husband shows signs of abnormal brain aging. How can you encourage him to get help and be evaluated by a neurologist if he refuses to keep an appointment? And I think that's, that's a challenging one because we all see signs, especially, you know, one of the tragedies of this disease is that there's not a self-awareness. I've, I've, I've hardly ever diagnosed a patient with Alzheimer's disease and had them say anything to me than, other than, yeah, so <laughs> um, it's not the diagnosis that the family receives. So one of the things that we see in Alzheimer's disease and dementia is that there's a lack of awareness of the individual suffering from the disease. That makes it very, very hard on families. It makes it very, very hard on caregivers that are trying to help the person because they often become the, the worst uh, person in a patient's life because they're telling them not to drive or they're telling them that they can't manage a checkbook anymore. So, it, so it's a, a big time challenge. We have social services here at the Brain Center. They're all devoted to helping caregivers because I think what's unique about our place is that we realize that when we diagnose somebody with dementia, it's very rarely that we'll diagnose one person. It's usually one and then the family. And so caregivers need a lot of support and uh, it's a challenge. I always tell people if there is a skepticism about coming to the appointment that we're just here to try to do a neurologic checkup. A lot of the times we make an appointment and we, we fear the worst and we actually come out saying, you know, your brain is actually aging in a very healthy way when it comes to the MRI and to the memory testing. And I know it's a change in how you think you're doing, but actually in, in the context or from the perspective of aging, actually doing it very well. So I always, I always convince people to, if they're going to come to, to say, this is something that is a good checkup. The earlier we diagnose these changes, the earlier we can do something about. So I try to be proactive. But the reality of the situation is a lot of people are hesitant to, to uh, be diagnosed or to be evaluated. And uh, I think just keep hammering away and, and eventually um, works out. I don't know, Kat has a lot of experience with this. Maybe you have something in perspective. Um, one, I also encourage, if you're having that trouble with those conversations, we have a library that's open from 8.30 to 4.30 uh, with information on kind of to help you along with these conversations. We also offer caregiver classes. And sometimes you just need the tool to be able to use the right words to understand your loved one a little better so that possibly you can get them here. And then just like Dr. Ritter was saying, you know, there's always the hope or the chance that maybe the memory loss or these things you're seeing is driven by something else, medication or sleep apnea, um, things that we could tweak um, to someone that could make a significant difference. So, and then um, maybe bringing a loved one here for one of our lunch and learns. We have one every Wednesday. So they come to our facility and kind of get more familiar and realize this is a, a, a great opportunity. So um, I believe this is from one of the gentlemen in the audience. 
Walking is good for the brain. Is sex also the same? <laughs> I see Dr. Ritter pass that to you. <laughs> so if we want to get to the science of it, if we're looking at, you know, reducing our risk and, you know, promoting healthy circulation and, and all of those types of things, then, then I would say that, yes, yeah, sex is analogous to, uh, to preventative uh, cog for cognitive decline. How's that sound? That sounds good. Good all right. answer. All right, next. <laughs> next answer. We're moving on. I think this is a really good question. So um, does intermittent fasting help improve the brain and reduce risk for dementia? Um, so there are a lot of theories out about how to improve the brain and reduce the risk for dementia, and some of them are packaged together in different protocols and different nutritions and different supplements. And uh, there's actually been several books that are on the New York Times bestseller that say reversing Alzheimer's disease with some of these um, methods in, in terms of supplements and, and lifestyle changes. And I would say that there's a lot of good theories behind this. So intermittent fasting is the idea that uh, you go long periods of time between eating, particularly in the evening, and it allows the biochemical uh, mechanisms in the body and in the brain to kind of repair themselves and go to the state of ketogenesis. The theories are based on preclinical models, so models in mice and even uh, animals that are less developed than, than humans, and um, so, so there's good data that's come out of that. I, I will say that we've been able to cure Alzheimer's disease in mice for a long time, and it hasn't worked in humans. And so similar things like, like, like this, intermittent fasting and packages of, of, of care uh, may have some basis in, in, in science, but we don't know if they work. So uh, we always say that the... Uh, the claims are usually exaggerated, and the science is unproven. Um, there are several uh, functional medicine groups in this town that will charge you anywhere from $15,000 to $20,000 to put you on one of these protocols. And I think the protocols themselves have some basis in science, but they're not proven science. So in, in, unless you want to pay for something that's proven, I, I wouldn't do those things. And anytime you go to a doctor and you're having to pay out-of-pocket costs, I think that should raise some red flags, especially when it comes to dementia. So for me, the jury's still out on does intermittent fasting help improve the brain? Does it seem like a good idea? Does it seem like it helps uh, in the models and in, and in animals? Yes, but has it been proven in humans? No, it has not. Okay. Um, what kind of diagnostic testing is in the pipeline for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, like anything, uh, specifically Alzheimer's disease, a diagnostic is the gold standard. And we say this because the only way that we know you have Alzheimer's disease is when you tell us. And it's typically an adult child or a spouse that will come in and, and identify the signs and symptoms that we spoke about here today. So finding an actual diagnostic like we do for heart disease, where we draw blood from you and we come into the clinic and we look at your LDL, HDL, your triglycerides, your homocysteine levels, your C-reactive protein, and we're able to, to say that you have X amount of risk for heart disease is really important because a lot of you are on those heart disease medications right now based on a simple blood test. So in Alzheimer's disease, yes, there, in research we're looking at a blood test, we're looking at cerebral spinal fluid, we're looking at medical imaging, uh, we're looking at even uh, looking into the retinas of people's eyes and see if there's a way that we can start to, to look at a diagnostic. And that's really important for Alzheimer's disease because if we were able to diagnose earlier, we would be able to start treatment earlier, which is the gold standard to preserve the neurons of the memory centers of the brain. So there's a lot of research going into right now, finding a diagnostic which will then spur potential therapeutics earlier into play as opposed to when you tell us you're having memory and thinking problems. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a really good question. And I think the other thing I would, I would just add, there's no prognostic marker for uh, any of our diseases. So we, we know that some people that never develop memory problems are gonna have amyloid protein in their brain. 
and those maybe those are the super yeah, agers. Yeah. Um, and we know that some people have low levels of amyloid in their brain are going to develop Alzheimer's, and then some people are not even have any amyloid and they're going to develop dementia. So it's very clear, right? It, it sounds very clear just by that last uh, description uh, that we know what we're doing. <laughs> and the reality of the situation is the last 20 years, we've come a long way, but there's still a lot more work to, to, to do. And the fact that we can say that right now, we don't have a prognostic marker for Alzheimer's disease is, shows us that we need a lot more work to do. And, and the diagnosis itself is based on both a constellation of s symptoms, so, so s a syndrome of forgetfulness or, or loss in, in how the brain is functioning, as well as biomarkers, so biological markers that support the diagnosis. That's the, that's the gold standard of diagnosis. There's not one specific thing that can say, I'm going to get Alzheimer's disease. You know, read about the blood test for Alzheimer's disease that's coming out. Even if we are able to analyze the amyloid in the bloodstream, it's still not going to be the diagnostic marker for Alzheimer's disease. So it's a very complicated picture, and uh, it's also one of the reasons why it's been so hard to find treatments. So I have, a, I have a question from my, my friend Alonzo, who's hiding in the audience here. I don't know if he's <laughs> left already. Oh, there he is. He's a question about telomere length. And telomeres, uh, and his question is, does telomere length affect overall brain health and natural de defenses against dementias? Do you, do you want to comment on telomeres? Did you miss uh, the end of your lecture? So I didn't know if it was. So I, I, I didn't touch on telomeres, but it's senescence I did touch on, but okay. not telomeres. Uh, so, so telomeres are these kind of this. Cap end. Yeah, so this is the end of, end of our genes that sort of protect us. It's sort of like, what's a, what's a good analogy? I'm going to say an analogy. Uh, uh, an, an excess, uh, uh, I guess it's like having insurance. It's yeah, like an insurance yeah. policy that keeps getting whittled down every year that we're alive. And it seems to be that the length of the telomeres, we can lose telomeres without the, the cell losing function, but once the telomere is, is uh, basically used up or, or cut up or, or destroyed, then the, the effects of aging become much more hard on the, on the cell. So, so the idea of extending telomeres or, or, or buffering the telomeres by buying more insurance, I think, is the analogy I think we're going to go toward. And that's really interesting, the, the, uh, the biochemical uh, milieu of the individual cell and how the cells interact with the neurons in the brain is kind of what we're dealing with in Alzheimer's disease. That's why it's such a complicated disease, and the, and the connections in the brain and the networks that are uh, involved in, in functioning are so, uh, so dramatic, um, and, and when we see that being lost in the disease, it's, it's very complicated. And so our brain is processing 16 million bits of information at, in one second, and so we, we can see how complicated a system it is, and, and when we see these proteins build up and damage that, we can see the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Well, I have a good question about uh, how to contact through, this question is, can we use emails to contact you? I think, again, the Healthy Brains website. So the best way, if you want to have direct to direct contact with our center and learn more about clinical trials, I would encourage you to sign up for Healthy Brains, uh, our website. And then we also have a flyer all about clinical trials on the back table, um, which has the where to either call or email. Uh, emails are easier for us to kind of manage on a timely manner, so I encourage um, healthy brains at ccf.org, um, and we can see if we have a clinical trial or help you with your question. And I would say that even if there's not a clinical trial or research study that's available today, it's likely that we'll be doing things in the future. So, if, and not everybody's a, a, a candidate for a clinical trial. Sometimes they close and they're open. So, uh, your interest over a long periods of time is, is really helpful for us because we don't always match the right people to the right study. So um, patience and, and being part of this Healthy Brains Registry where we can contact you rapidly when we say, oh yeah, we do have a clinical trial available. Um, my boss, Dr. Marwan Sabah, who's been here about a year, 
um, is very interested in bringing new technologies and new clinical trials. So I looked at my list this morning. We have about 20 new clinical trials coming down the, the pipe. So even if today we, d we can't match here, say we don't have something for you today, but maybe in the future. Yep. Uh, what's the last That's question it. here? Yeah. We didn't have a question about marijuana. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. CBD and marijuana. So I don't want any unanswered questions about <laughs> CBD or marijuana. Uh, so I think that the, the, answer, well, the, the answer to the marijuana question is it's unanswered. So unfortunately, the FDA uh, embargoes the study of class one drugs. So class one drugs are anything that's illegal. And unfortunately, even though marijuana is legal in the state of Nevada, it's not federally legal. So we can't study it very well. So we don't really know the effects of marijuana on the brain. What we do know is that some symptoms can be helped by CBD in particular, and I think that sleep, anxiety, and appetite, we ch tend to see improvements in, in those symptoms. But in terms of cognition and overall brain health, we, the jury is still out on THC and CBD. We have a true believer in the and I and I and I think I think I'll be open to the idea that it will work. It's just not proven science yet. Well, thank you for the com thank you for the comment. I think this is this is science that uh, potentially holds some benefit from it, just unproven yet. And I think I've heard definitely stories of of improvements, but I I can't um, endorse. endorse it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. I think we're yeah. all done. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> It's, it's truly an honor um, and to have gentlemen like Brian and Dr. Ritter here imparting their wisdom with us. Um, there will be more, so if you like what you heard today, please tell your friends. Um, we will communicate other events through healthybrains.org, so if you haven't already signed up there, um, there's a table with uh, Brooke in the back. And I appreciate everyone um, being very patient with the RSVPs and there's lunch, there's no lunch. Uh, we had an overwhelming response, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and my favorite fact about our building is that there are 199 windows and no two are alike. None of them are alike just like all of us, and it's very important that we bring our unique perspective, our unique backgrounds um, in this journey together um, to help find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, have a wonderful day.